Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. It is fantastic to have you here, despite the fact that this is a little bit of a sad video. As, as you will remember, yesterday we received some gorgeous pieces of equipment into the workshop. Utterly gorgeous pieces of equipment. But there was a problem with the biggest, most exciting, and also most expensive part of this whole puzzle. Which was, as soon as I hopped on that truck and I took the pallet wrapping off it, I noticed this. The motor feet are completely broken. Every single one. Look at that over there. Cracks all over this thing. It's cracked in here. Look at that. Broken to pieces. On the front as well. Look at this. It's, it's completely open. Completely devastating. So this is incredibly upsetting. The reason that we went for this hammer is it was supposedly completely good to go. It's had a professional repair done on it by the best hammer mechanic in the country. Some welding had to get done to the RAM and that was done, you know, the best way possible. This is meant to have really low hours on it. It has the messed up paint job, but I think that was done intentionally to make it look worn. It supposedly had very little use. The motor, we know, had had a professional repair done by a well-known motor rewinding company. And I figure that's when those welds that you see that are on there, I figure that's when those were put on. And I know it was also rewound. Now, why this hammer? Well, that's because when spending this amount of money, the amount of money involved in needing to get a hammer of this size and needing to get it here is huge. And I didn't want to put that money in a machine that was not known that I didn't have assurance was, you know, a really good running machine. So that's why I spent tens of thousands of dollars on this as opposed to spending less money on a machine that, you know, wouldn't have as much of a history that we could find out about. Part of the reason we also got this is that it's a single piece hammer. So that means a hammer of this weight category generally has the anvil of the hammer separate, requiring you to pour a foundation for that anvil which is different to the foundation for the rest of it. And so it's two pieces, and there's, you know, generally gonna be several thousand more dollars in expenses getting it set up, because you've gotta dig a hole, and it's gotta be just right with the concrete for the anvil. The big appeal to this is that we'd get this off the truck, we'd slide this thing in, and we're gonna have our electrician come in. He was scheduled yesterday afternoon, he did come in, but to look at the problems, he was gonna come in, wire it up, and today, Friday, this thing would be forging steel, and we'd be able to start making this huge investment actually pay returns and make money. Instead, it's now Will's perch. Back to the topic at hand, which is this power hammer, and what we're gonna do, we are going to have to get a brand new motor whether it's used or whether it's brand new, I'm gonna have to get a new motor and fit it into place and get it to fit perfectly. So, part of what we need to do is find out how fast this motor is, find out what it is, what the shaft diameter is, and what we're gonna need out of a motor so that we can then start hunting for one. This motor comes into some gears in here. It all looks pretty cool, but it's covered by this housing. So I'm gonna take the oiler off get that housing disconnected, pull it off, so that we can work out what shaft we need for the motor. So let's get to it, and hopefully we won't break anything. Look at this. This is completely loose on the shaft. Yeah, let's go ahead and pick that motor off it. So the gear from the motor is loose. We can't rotate the gear to see if it's meant to be tight. Not that anything makes me believe it would make sense for it to not be tight. The motor now really serves no purpose, so we're just gonna take the motor off. It's gonna give us more access to this and more access to make a plan about what we do with another motor. And as I'm taking this apart, I'm just trying to make sure that I don't do things I'm gonna regret down the line. More data can't hurt, right? Super rough measurement, 8.8555 inches to the top of the shaft, very rough. I 
wish I knew more about this stuff. This end plate is all loose and has been dented and hammered on and what have you. This here, it's an inch and a half hole. So, we need an inch and a half shaft. We're gonna be able to measure the keyway. 0370, oh, so. 0370, oh, it's probably 0375, oh, it's probably a 3 8 key. So what we need, is we need a motor that is 1750 or so RPM, three phase, 15 horsepower, has a one and a half inch shaft with a 3 8 inch keyway, and we know it needs to be as long as that shaft was. We could do some stuff and adjust it, but at this point, it's time for some eBay hunting. 15 horsepower, 1765 RPM. 15 horse, 1765. Golly, that's a big motor. We found one good looking 15 horsepower motor on eBay. The trouble is, is looking up the model number. It's a 1.625 shaft instead of a 1.5 shaft. There is always the option of opening up that gear, but I don't want to do that. There's a whole lot of inch and 5 eighths shafts, inch and 3 eighths shafts, but not a whole lot of inch and a half shafts into 15 horsepower motors. Okay, I found a list of an electronic motor NEMA frame sizes table. Have a look at this. This is the diameter, this is the length. Here are the frame sizes. Let's scroll on down until we start getting up to an inch and an eighth, three quarter, inch and an eighth, inch and three eighths, one inch, inch and an eighth, inch and three eighths, inch and five eighths, inch and five eighths, inch and a quarter, inch and five eighths, inch and five eighths. And there's no inch and a half. Okay, a weekend has passed since I last chatted to you. So in that time, I posted an Instagram story asking, you kind folks, if anybody would have a 15 horsepower motor with these specifications for sale, and two of you, Cameron and Jonathan, both sent me messages to a link for a 15 horsepower motor 326 frame that was available for sale online from a used equipment sales company. And I've been in contact with them. And so check this out. That is one big motor. I had them get some measurements for me and have a look at that. The bolt hole centers are the exact same as in the casting for the machine, which is awesome. The base to the center of the shaft is pretty much exactly the same. The shaft length is exactly right. The only issue is the shaft diameter is an eighth of an inch too large. The one on the existing motor is an inch and a half in diameter. And that's an inch and five eighths. What's interesting about this is I cannot find anywhere a 15 horsepower motor with an inch and a half diameter shaft. That's apparently a really rare thing. You can't get a modern motor with an inch and a half diameter shaft. So any sort of NEMA classification of motor is a no-go for it. And so yes, the shaft doesn't line up with the hole in the gear that we have. And it may not be the most difficult thing in the world for us to actually modify the gear. This is a micarta or phenolic gear. How awesome is that? This is canvas. An epoxy. I was over here thinking this thing was cast iron, but it's not. To protect the gears back there, to make this out of something way softer. And when you have a look at the top here, it almost looks like it's been retrofitted to work with this shaft size. It almost looks like it at one point had a much larger bore. I don't know if that's exactly the case, but what I do feel is we might be in a pretty good position to retrofit this into having a larger bore. What do you reckon, Will? Should I wait until the motor arrives, or should I open this gear up now so I can make a plan of action for how I'm gonna open it up to an inch and five eighths? Open it up now. Why? Because ADHD. We know that you're not gonna wait anyway, so you might as well just not wait sooner. And open it up. Yes. Oh. So the carbide burr opened up those rivet heads and we were able to pull this off. I really want to make sure I keep track of everything. A, B, C, flip it all over, A, B, C. A lot of these rivets are completely loose. There we go, there's one, there's A. Is this epoxied to that? I have no idea. It's not moved so far. The grub screw is still installed. Astounding. How stupid I can be. Utterly astounding. <laughs> yes! Right, so Will just came over and suggested the idea of freezing it, and we called up a friend of his who knows a lot more about this type of stuff. He seems to think freezing it could work for us to safely pull this out. Because the thing I'm worried about is we could go to the hydraulic press 
and then support it like this and push it out. But we're then putting a lot of force on just the teeth. That makes me nervous. So this is gonna go in the freezer at home and sit overnight. And we'll see if it just pops right out. Alrighty, it's the next morning. This has been in the freezer all night. Ooh, it's quite chilly. Let's see if it comes out nice and easy. Oh boy. Freezing it hasn't worked altogether too well. That moved it. Yeah, that moved it. Now we just needed to make a thing to support this. Oh, it's so close. Not close enough to feel good about it though. That one's better. That one's much better. That was an ordeal, but we now have a free grease track inside the gear. Yeah, so look at this. Oh! This is a, a little part, there was some sort of, um, there was a thread that got sheared off. It looks like there was some sort of maybe like steel. I think it was a helicoil. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Yeah, like a steel helicoil type thing to make the thread diameter smaller. That's exactly what it is. And basically we just ripped out some of it and dragged it through. You can see the damage from dragging that through. I don't think it's going to be a major issue at all. You can, however, cut that off. So the way this works, this is incredibly light, that's so funny. The way this works is this is what goes on the shaft. It has a keyway in it, and then because of these flanges with three holes... <coughs> <coughs> Lining up with three of these six holes, it's able to transmit power from the key here through to the gear itself. It's super cool. But what this means is, is that for us to get this to work, all we've got to do is either retrofit this or make a brand new piece. So clearly, other people before us have had issues. Because look at this, set screw hole one, the existing one we're using today. Set screw hole two. Set screw hole three. This thing has been retrofitted what looks like about four times. Obviously, I'd be thrilled if it was good to go first time, but there is still an adventure along this dark path. So we're gonna go ahead and take some measurements and draw this up. I'm kind of feeling like I might need to do this on the computer. I don't know if my brain is good enough to do it without the computer. So I'm gonna open up Fusion 360 and do a little, uh, do a little CAD. Alrighty, I've come up with a little bit of an idea. So, obviously, as you all know, inch and a half bore as it currently stands. Well, outside diameter on this thing right there, 2.61. We need a 1.625 inch bore, inch and five eighths. But it needs to have a keyway in it. In case you're unfamiliar, this is a keyway. It is to accommodate a piece of three eighths inch square key stock. The way that this is made is it's either with a keyway brooch, which is a tool which is tapered and it has teeth as it goes up in size and you then have a bushing that holds it in the round hole and you drive it down with an arbor press or a hydraulic press to cut the keyway. Well, we don't have one of those. They're a little bit expensive. I've got a little bit of a creative and potentially bad idea brewing in my head, which is we do what almost looks like has been done here which is we make a sleeve that fits in here with a keyway in it that I mill in using the bridge port and I mill it in to the outside of the insert piece, slip it in, weld it in place with the right size bore and the right size keyway. What makes me extra excited is I might be able to use this still. Use the existing assembly and what I'm gonna try is see if we can get this chucked up in the lathe dialed in to centered and straight, no wiggly wobbling on this bad boy. And then just bore this open to two inch round inside, and then we're gonna make ourselves a sleeve that's gonna fit inside that with the keyway.
All right, I got this thing in the lathe about as close as I can possibly get it. I have been, I have been battling this thing. I just don't think it's very round. We've got it to basically two thou. Okay, in some places it might be three thou. The next step is for us to use a boring bar to open up this hole to the diameter that we want. I'm gonna be shooting for two inches so we can put a two inch diameter sleeve in there. This is about five eighth diameter shank here on the boring bar, which means that for this four inch long piece, we'd be having, what, like six times diameter in stick out or more, which isn't meant to be particularly good thing. You're not meant to do that. The reason for it is having that much stick out means this is going to vibrate and potentially bend. So, as I'm going, I'm going to be using these to check for parallel sides in the hole. We're going to be having a listen to it, see how it goes. Worst case scenario, I'm going to have to order a larger diameter boring bar and get one of those on the way. But we're going to put this in the tool holder, get it to the right height, and give it a go, because if we don't give it a go, we're just going to be sat here looking rather stupid. All right, moment of truth. We've got it set up, it's centered, it's square. Let's see how she cuts. And let's hope it's very boring. Oh my! I can already feel the vibrations. Mmm, that's pricey. $220. Okay, alrighty, I found one for $80.50. I think that's gonna be it. It's a one inch right hand boring bar for the inserts that we have. You know, I'm looking at this website here and I'm seeing they have brooch sets. We might just broach it and that might just be the easiest thing to do ever. Alright, so in my cart I've got a boring bar. I also have a deburring tool because I broke mine. Then I have an inch and five eighths bushing and a 3 8 wide brooch that can broach up to six inches deep. And that's all it really costs. The brooch comes with shims and $12 plus $63, I think it's a worthwhile risk for us to try broaching it. And I think that that $63 is gonna be more than made up for in time saved by me simply just having to bore open the hole and then broach it out, as opposed to bore open the hole, make a sleeve, mill the sleeve, put the sleeve in, weld the sleeve in, make sure it's all concentric. So, we're gonna get this stuff ordered. Thank you all so much for joining us on this journey, this adventure that is giving us so much opportunity to learn, so much opportunity to challenge ourselves. I really hope that you subscribe to follow along with what happens going forward from here. Before we end this, let's thank today's sponsor. And that is Paragon and their heat treating ovens. They make an incredible line of heat treating ovens for bladesmiths, as well as all sorts of other artists. Glass blowers, jewelers, potters. Paragon creates some of the most accurate and efficient heat treating ovens that are available today, especially for the knife maker. They pay a huge amount of attention to the knife maker's needs, and that shows in this series of oven. This is Paragon's KM24 Pro Double Wide, and you'll see that it has ceramic baffle insulation on it, as well as integrated heating elements that wrap the whole way around. And because they wrap the whole way around, it gives you the most accurate and even heat possible around the whole circumference of the chamber. But not only that, there's three thermocouples, meaning that you have three zones all independently controlled through their own feedback loop, meaning that you get the most even heat through the whole oven, regardless of whether you've got a big old mass in the front and a thin old thing down at the back. The oven's gonna compensate for that to get you that even heat. This particular model features the Sentinel Smart Touch Control, which is incredibly easy to use and program. It's intuitive, you can get started real fast. And because of those ceramic baffles and those heating elements, it's gonna save you on electricity too over a traditional brick oven. Please folks, make sure that your next heat treating oven is a Paragon oven. You're not going to regret it. They're incredible bits of kit made in Mesquite, Texas, right here in the USA. And so be sure to check out Paragon at the links down below to find a dealer near you so that you can upgrade your heat treating game. Thank you Paragon for sponsoring this. Thank you guys for joining us. See you on the next one very, very soon. Bye-bye.